Hello, my name is Corey Gibson. I lecture in modern and contemporary Scottish literature at the University of Glasgow. I want to thank the Scottish Revival Network. Uh, I want to thank Scott and Michael and Jim uh, for having me along, for including me in the network. It looks really, really exciting and I feel very privileged uh, to be part of it. I'm very much looking forward to kicking ideas around with everyone uh, involved. So Scott asked me to, to prepare a few thoughts on how the post-war Scottish folk revival might be understood in relation to the interwar Scottish literary uh, renaissance. So that's what I've done. I've thought about how the one relates to the other, sort of coming at it from the revival side of things. Uh, I've also considered how these movements might be uh, compared, and I've tried to prepare some uh, reflections on the kinds of insights that might be gleaned uh, for literary critics and literary historians by the comparison. In November, 1948, a mass meeting was organised by the Scottish USSR Society at uh, St Andrew's Hall in Glasgow to mark the 25th anniversary of the death of John Maclean. Hamish Henderson presided and oversaw recitations and speeches by uh, poets, including Sidney Goodsir Smith, Sorley Maclean, uh, Morris Blytheman under his pseudonym Thurzo Berwick, John Kincaid and the man himself Hugh McDermott, as well as performances by folk singers, pipers, the Young Communist League Choir, uh, and Glasgow Unity Theatre. Blytheman would later describe this particular event in 1948 as, quote, the first swallow uh, of the Scottish folk revival. And as a kind of signal event of what was to come, I think we can read it as a kind of idealised version of the revival uh, in terms of its cultural and political makeup. Uh, in terms of its combination of literary and folk cultural performances coming together to memorialise a radical forebearer uh, and to institute a kind of radical tradition that might hopefully be extended. At least that's how many of those involved, uh, I think, saw it. Henderson would point repeatedly to the folk revival as, at the very least, a powerful component part. So he put quote, powerful component part of the literary renaissance, if not a discrete phase in the strategic development of the renaissance itself. His colleague at the School of Scottish Studies, uh, Ailey Monroe, in her later uh, 1984 history of the Scottish folk revival, The Democratic Muse, uh, still one of the best texts uh, on this topic, would later place the literary renaissance uh, as a vital precursor for the revival uh, in Scotland. So, quote from Monroe from The Democratic Muse, by the 1930s, the literary scene uh, was a kind of matrix in which the new structures and elements, uh, in which new structures and elements, as well as evocative old Scots words, struggled to be born or reborn, for it is often hard to distinguish between birth and rebirth, end quote. I think she, she muddies the waters there in a way that's really quite helpful, I think, for our purposes here as part of the, the Scottish Revival Network with this idea that one movement or revival, uh, one birth or rebirth might grow out of the other, uh, sometimes supplanting, sometimes extending, sometimes sort of getting tangled up in one another and stumbling over one another. Though Monroe felt that the Renaissance provided a matrix or structure for the revival to move through, it is important to note, however, that she gives much more credence to the earlier folk revival in the US as a precursor and as, a, as an important um, grounding for understanding where the revival in Scotland comes from. And she has a kind of materialist analysis of this. She places that pretty squarely in terms of the cultural policies of FDR's New Deal. So, for instance, she points to Alistair Cook's series of broadcasts for the BBC in the 1930s, I Heard America Singing, which uh, drew from John Lomax, that is Alan Lomax's father's uh, Library of Congress field recordings, uh, points to those broadcasts uh, and says that these, in fact, alerted a future generation of Scottish revivalists to the urgency and potency of the living folk culture out among working class people. Uh, also, I think, alerted them to the notion of a technology of recording that might be mobile enough um, to make these kinds of recordings and to bring these kinds of soundscapes into institutional uh, and urban centres like uh, the Library of Congress. Uh, 
from the fields where these songs were sung. There's a certain uh, poetic appeal, I think, to the idea of a memorial marking the anniversary of Maclean's death, uh, providing uh, the birth, the first swallow of a nascent cultural movement in Scotland. But before we get into the weeds with the sort of mythic currency of Red Clydeside, I think we can safely say that the revival did, at least in many of its early manifestations, hold the so-called Maclean line, as McDermott called it, and as he long advocated for, that is the line for a Scottish workers' uh, republic. So we can see elements of this borne out, at least in spirit, by the kinds of political songs that come out of the revival in the 50s and 60s, from the recovery of songs of itinerant ploughmen against the landed farmer, or the tenant farmer for that matter at times, to the sangs of the stain, an image on the slide there, uh, after the reaving of the stone of destiny uh, from Westminster uh, around Christmas in 1950 to the CND anti-Polaris songs of the Holy Loch protests, the Ding Dong Dollar LP, uh, whose cover is also there and its attendant uh, pamphlets. Uh, a wee aside there, in terms of relating the revival to an august literary history, it's worth noting that um, supposedly, uh, I haven't found the textual evidence of this, uh, I have found people claim this, that the Ding Dong Dollar songs were translated into Russian um, during a visit of Samuel Marshak uh, to Scotland in the early 60s. Marshak, famously the, the Soviet translator of Burns and Shakespeare. Hamish Henderson, who uh, was involved in the publication of this, as well as many of these, um, these collections that I'm going to be talking about today, had been at the forefront of the Maclean event in 1948, and he perhaps did uh, more than any other to theorise the revival in Scotland. He was concerned with its cogency, or lack thereof at times, with its meaning for a national cultural politics, but also with its relationship with a longer history of cycles of seeming decline, even extinctions, and that's his words, uh, his word, uh, and then attendant revivals. That long historical view prompted him to be alert to the social, economic, religious, and uh, technological forces that influence the shape and life course of such revivals. So he really recognised the kind of historical contingencies that he's wrestling with as a revivalist, as well as as a folk scholar. And so this perspective helped him to recognise that these revivals were often at the very least patronised, if not led, by those whose privilege and social status separated them from the folk whose culture they were thought to be preserving and popularising. And a lot of what distinguishes his approach can be understood as an attempt to foreclose or minimise that kind of power imbalance. The Clyde group of poets were another force that helps to connect McDermott's particular project with that of the folk revival. Uh, the Clyde group were made up of John Kincaid, more to whom I've already mentioned, who was um, from some poetry at the 1948 John McLean event, George Todd, F.J. Anderson, and Thurzo Berwick, again, has already come up. These poets felt themselves to be writing through McDermott's legacy in his, in his particular capacity as a torchbearer for the Maclean line. They were keen, for instance, to distinguish themselves from the so-called Lallans Mackers, whose experiments in Scots they deemed a kind of bourgeois distraction uh, that only took the work uh, further from the material lives of the people. As George Todd put it in his poem Embra Mackers, we muckle complacence there's talk of renaissance, at the leer of the screevers you'd gout but their etlin te sum in a river gai tum, can they leave out the wants of the folk. So having recited their works at the Maclean Memorial, alongside the doyen of the Renaissance and the chief strategist of the nascent revival, the Clyde group brought their works together in a volume titled Fowersome Real, 1949. And under that folk-inspired title, their work is introduced by McDermott as part of the urgent drive in modern Scottish poetry towards de bourgeois, sorry, trip over this word, de bourgeoisification, de anglification, and scientism, uh, scientization, sorry. Alternatively, Henderson was full of praise with a slightly different emphasis. He saw their spoken poetry and uh, Thurzo Berwick. Morris Blythman's in particular, as combining literary and folk cultural elements in such a way as to justify his whole conception of politically engaged folk poetry, extending the Renaissance and founding a popular revival uh, in one move. 
So there's only perhaps a partial inheritance. I think we can draw at least some, some pretty straight lines between the interwar literary renaissance of the 1920s and 30s and the post-war folk revival. The eventual popular success of the revival, which couldn't reasonably expect reasonably be expected or imagined at the John McLean Memorial in 1948, rests, uh, I would argue, at least in part, on the failures of the literary renaissance, at least on the terms we're determined you know, very very consciously setting up to fail, I think, in many examples. Uh, the terms McDermott sometimes set for it to affect dramatic political transformations or to reach and then propagandize uh, to popular audiences. In fact, I think there's a case to be made that the revival did more in its own lifetime than the Renaissance did in its lifetime on these fronts. It anticipated some of the intellectual justifications for cultural nationalism that would follow in the next decades. And indeed, we might point to particular revivalists in shaping a vernacular nationalist politics of the devolutionary and post-devolutionary periods. Among other more obvious differences, the revival wasn't as concerned as the Renaissance sometimes had been with trying to figure out whether it was actually happening or not, uh, whether it had happened or whether it was still to happen. And though there is some considerable talk in the folk magazines trying to get a fix on when the revival had peaked, if it was on the way back down again yet. Nor was the revival as concerned with the grand and distant horizons for its cultural project for the nation, with the exception of, of, of some of Henderson's writings, uh, very often you know, in publications um, that McDermott edited or had otherwise been associated with and taken on some of that kind of uh, bombastic kind of journalistic line that, that McDermott did in some of his prose work. Yeah, and Henderson's writings on this topic that, that, that make that case for the revival are incidentally appearing in popular magazines and newspapers, but also literary journals and later folk magazines. Publications like Arthur Argo's chat book, uh, subtitled Scotland's Folk Life magazine, were more concerned with the material life of uh, folk culture and the pressures it faced on the ground. The perceived neglect of traditional singers by the BBC, the work required to maintain local folk clubs and curate successful festivals, and the degree to which commercial forces might be accommodated or resisted in preserving a tradition and seeking out new tradition bearers. In this sense, though it was made up of a loose network of singers, collectors, musicians, aficionados, some interesting debates uh, in these magazines around what constitutes an aficionado, uh, musicians, aficionados, clubs, and festivals had all these features. So it was a kind of organized by comparison uh, to the Renaissance and could sustain itself for a while at least without having to insist on the fact of itself, if you like. So both the Renaissance and the revival were host to entrenched debates around tradition and modernization, uh, cosmopolitanism and parochialism, affectation and authenticity. And though the former uh, was often comfortable dealing in the abstract on these issues, whereas the revivalists were very often looking at concrete applications. How far do we tolerate the tambourine or God forbid the electric guitar, for instance. It's also interesting to note that Chapbook, the most prominent magazine of the revival, of course, is a title so close to that of the Scottish Chapbook, which McDermott had done so much, um, in which McDermott had done so much to pronounce a Renaissance 40 years earlier. And this in turn connects both the revival and the Renaissance, of course, to popular print cultures of the 18th century, um, which you might think um, goes some way to expressing the kind of uh, dialectical and sometimes contradictory position that McDermott stated for the Renaissance, right? That it's about going back to Dunbar and not to Burns, but there, there is an invocation of the kind of literary cultures that made certain modes of literary expression very popular and aligned them with ideas about locality and national, um, a national sort of um, framework for politics. If the Maclean rally was the first swallow of the revival, Maurice Fleming identified the first unofficial folk club of the revival as that started by Hamish Henderson and Callum Maclean, uh, brother to Sorley, another direct connection between the Renaissance and the Revival, um, at what would become the University Staff Club on Chamber Street in Edinburgh, transcriptions and recordings from their field work for the then brand new School of Scottish Studies were shared among growing audiences and future tradition bearers night by night. 
it became, quote, a clearinghouse and a seminary for young collectors. This kind of setup would, um, interestingly, create a, a kind of dynamic where it was possible, especially for singers um, out in the field uh, without access to these ne networks, to these spaces, to be, as Fleming put it, quote, inside the tradition, but outside of the revival. Both movements, the Renaissance and the Revival, can also be understood uh, as interventions in a kind of national cultural historiography. The first, to put it very cr crudely, looking to break with the seeming sentimentalism of the kale yard and to explain the country's cultural malaise, to identify which traditions to jettison and which precedents to take up. And the second, insisting on a living tradition that had been rendered invisible in popular culture, whilst absorbing a thoroughly comparative perspective of local and national folk life. Henderson was therefore able to read the revival back in to McDermott and his earlier works uh, as the answer to riddles such as, are my poems spoken in the factories and in the fields? Can there know that I'm failing today what I ought to have done? During their public flightings, indeed, Henderson made this very point, uh, but McDermott contended that, the fo that folk culture could only hope to be a springboard for significant literary work. Henderson, however, felt that that debt was in fact foundational and not simply incidental, not just a springboard, but something much more grounded and something much more uh, secure and uh, persistent and consistent as part of the literary history, uh, particularly in Scotland. And he wasn't the only revivalist to make a case for a long established cross fertilization between Scotland's folk and literary cultures. Ewan McCall, among others, in the pages of Chapbook, point variously to Dunbar and the so called Scottish Chaucerians, to uh, Alan Ramsay, to Ferguson and Burns, to through the Gibbon and McDermott as coordinate points in this history. And though it's articulated differently at different junctures, this notional proximity between Scotland's folk culture and its literary history is a near constant in the modern history of Scottish literary criticism. Around this time, for instance, it's expressed by David Craig, an ally of Henderson's in the flighting with McDermott in his book Scottish Literature and the Scottish People of 1961. This notion sits close to ideas about the democratic vernacular, to the elision between working class identities and national identity in Scotland, and to the tensions between romantic nationalism and socialist internationalism that are present um, in, in, in our period. In terms of reading the revival back into the Renaissance, there are a great many more writers we might look to, not least um, Willa Muir in Living with Ballads. Uh, William Souter and Violet Jacob, for instance, in terms of their working in folk forms. Uh, Naomi Mitchison in her use of folk beliefs, especially in her historical fiction. Uh, Sidney Goodsir Smith in his work in the folk idiom, his role in the publication of the Merry Muses. But there are also those that the revival itself explicitly brought back into focus. Uh, and there I'd point to figures like Joe Corey, F. Marion McNeil, and Mary Brooksbank, each of whom were frequently featured in the pages of a magazine like Chapbook uh, throughout the 1960s. And though McNeil had been an important figure in the Renaissance, she sits equally comfortably here as part of the scholarly apparatus of the revival. Corrie's In Time of Strife had been staged as part of the first Edinburgh People's Festival uh, in which Hamish Henderson was instrumental. But of course, Corrie wasn't only a poet and a playwright, but in fact, a songwriter and song collector. And in fact, um, as a closer look at some of the folk revival magazines, um, demonstrates he was a sometime performer on the folk club circuit uh, late in his life uh, in the 1960s, at least in a couple of clubs in Fife. Uh, so Corey was also the subject of a special issue of Chapbook in which the absorption of this quote, perfect vehicle for folk song uh, into the revival is celebrated as a corrective to the relative neglect he was thought to have suffered since the war. The connections have sketched out between these movements. I hope invite us to consider what the so-called second wave of the literary renaissance looks like and what the literary history of the post-war period more broadly looks like if it's opened up to Matt McGinn's tender lullabies or his shaggy dog stories, to Jeannie, Roberts inter Jeannie Robertson's interpretations of the Muckle Sangs uh, or her folk tales to the Geely Peace song, or even to, to, to Billy Conley's patter between tunes uh, for the humble bums. In other words, to products of the revival beyond the kinds of works that are thought to have transcended it, such as Henderson's The Freedom Come All Ye.
The revivalists, and most especially its collectors, were part of the broader move away from the idea of folk culture as a pre-modern phenomenon, relying on rural, isolated conditions, stubbornly surviving through later epochs. And this was a move away from those precepts to a more fluid and open-ended conception that could see contemporary life in a city as a site for the song collector, the folklorist, also. This is happening among folklorists, anthropologists and ethnomusicologists um, sort of all over the place, really. Henderson and his peers were part of this shift in Scotland. Though as with the stated aims of the literary Renaissance, progress was uneven and sometimes, as with the Renaissance, the sort of enunciation of this fact alone was kind of deemed enough. Sorry, just winding up. A further 25 years after John McLean's death in 1973, the Edinburgh University Student Publication Board put a collection of songs, poems and dialogues titled Homage to John McLean. And this was edited uh, by Thurzell Berwick and the minor poet, uh, minor as in co minor, minor as in not major, minor poet uh, T.S. Law. It featured all the speakers from the event in 1948 Henderson, Sorley McLean, McDermott, Good Sir Smith, the Clyde Group, but added others like Matt McGinn, Edwin Morgan, Tom Scott, William Neal, uh, Derek Thompson, to name a few. Here again, literary figures and revivalists shared a platform under McLean's banner. But I think the relationship between the Renaissance and the revival can do more than mark time, more than count the generations that have passed since Red Clydeside. It provides us with a useful point of entry into the whole question of the relationship between literary cultures and folk culture in Scotland, which, as I've suggested, has been vital to the history of Scottish literary criticism. It helps us to think about how the histories of Scottish literature and folk culture that we have inherited were formulated uh, and, and by whom. And for me, it's also invited other research questions that foreground the very particular confluences of literature and folk culture uh, in the period with which we're concerned as part of the Scottish revival network. So the kinds of things I'm, I'm thinking about expanding into in trying to, um, to understand this issue uh, in more depth Things like the literary afterlives of Fraser's Golden Bow and Jane Ellen, Jane Ellen Harrison's study of Greek religion uh, in Scotland. And these are acknowledged influences in, in modernism more generally, but what were their particular permutations in the works of uh, Scottish writers? Certainly, uh, Henderson accredits them very directly with informing his idea of a vast folk underground on which the kind of artifice, artifice of literary history is built. What does William McGonagall's example do for the parallel traditions in literature and the folk idiom in Scotland? There's a really, really important Henderson essay on this very topic and also a very important McDermott essay on this topic um, too. So what happens when we have uh, a poet who is writing across literary and folk idioms and combining them in, in such a way as to kind of fail at both? He's a really important sort of touchstone in these kinds of debates. Uh, we might consider how rituals and folk beliefs are represented in the fiction of mid 20th century Scottish novelists, but how do these um, representations compare or combine with um, other sort of material forces? And of course, a kind of big underlying question here, who gets to curate our folk culture as opposed to our literary cultures in this period? As I mentioned earlier, um, a great deal of the revivals that Henderson noted uh, in his career uh, relied on patronage, institutions, state, um, commercial forces to sustain themselves. So lots more to talk about and I'd invite you to please send any questions along to me. My email address was on the, the first slide here. Very much looking forward to seeing you all, talking to you all. Thank you very much for your time.